Welcome back to Pop Culture Graveyard. I am Hollis. With me, as always, is Dave. Hello, Dave. Hello, Hollis. <laughs> I don't know why. I always expect something special, some razzle-dazzle. We are bringing you Alien from 1979, one of the greatest science fiction franchises of all time, kicked off with this movie. But before we get to Alien, our last episode was on another movie from 1979, the Muppet movie. And we forgot, Dave, to speak about perhaps the greatest tagline we've ever encountered. Agreed. The Muppet movie, the tagline was more entertaining than humanly possible. I love a tagline. Not so clever that it doesn't fit. Yeah. This one is so clever. And it even makes you go, wait, why is that? Oh, yeah, that's really good. Yeah. Yeah. They're yeah. not human, and no human film can bring you this could much be, warmth, could be this. So that's great. That's going to be hard to top. Well, I was going to say that we could actually tweak the tagline for the Muppet movie to be the tagline for Alien, more horror than humanly possible. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I have to say, I like the Alien tagline, which, of course, is in space, no one can hear you scream. Which is a great line on its own. For one of the most famous taglines in cinema, I personally don't think it's a great tagline, Alien. Well, I think it's based on one great moment in the film in particular that we'll expand on later. I think it's a good tagline because it's literal. You know, you can't hear anyone in space, mm -hmm. the absence of whatever. But The atmosphere, it also, atmosphere disallows yeah, the yeah. vibrations that create sound. Yeah. Right. But also it speaks to the helplessness of the film's protagonists and their situation, you know? Oh, the long distance no one can hear you scream. Yeah. You're out there's there a, alone in space. There's no cavalry coming. Frequently in this film, the characters are alone. They are only available to each other via walkie-talkie sometimes. So no one's hearing you in a million ways. When you need them, you know, scream all you want. No one's coming. So I don't know. I kind of like that. I was doing something I often do, which is coming at it too scientifically literal. I'm like, mm. they're inside. They're in a spaceship the whole time. There's atmosphere, sound travels. Yeah, no, your explanation brings me around a little. I'll take it. Dave, when was the first time you saw Alien? Couldn't say. I don't, I don't have a memory for that stuff. Um, yeah. I actually now I'm half remembering that the first time I saw it, I picked it up with like 30 minutes to go or something. I just remember... I was flipping and Sigourney Weaver was in her little tiny t-shirt and underwear slipping into a space suit. And I was like, Stopped what is this? dead in your tracks. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I, I was about, I don't know what, 14 or something. And that would do Just it. right. Yep. Yeah. Instantly, if you know the ending of this film, instantly enraptured and just like, wow. And a female lead watching her triumph yeah. over it is a great thing to see for a young boy all i can say is that i definitely saw it and was frightened by it vaguely remember seeing it a second time reluctantly because the people i was with were like we'll go watch alien and i was like oh no that movie's terrifying it is so, truly terrifying so alien from 1979 directed by a master director ridley scott Ridley is still with us. His brother, another great director, Tony Scott, has passed on. But Ridley Scott, you know, my favorite thing about a director and what I look for is a director who can create a world, create a universe that rings true and that seems lived in. And he really hit the mark here. Yeah. The opening to Alien is the greatest gift to set builders ever done. Because yeah. all those people spent all that time on all those details and then Ridley Scott opened the movie by filming all of it and doing close-ups of all the little mm -hmm. googas and little widgets that so much work went into. And he totally did it justice. And I have to say, my thought five minutes into this film, before they even wake up, was they could just wander around. I wouldn't need anything to happen. I would watch this for two <laughs> hours. Yeah. And yeah, it's something that, that you can lay right at the feet also of Dan O'Bannon who did the screenplay and who created the story really with Ronald Shusett. Before Hollis starts to break down what this movie is about, I read a, a tweet once that broke it down so simply and so perfectly and with a great sense of humor that I wanted to read that before he got started. 
And that tweet was by Adam Shafto. And he said, so I've been writing reviews for about 10 years. My wife's review of Alien puts everything I have ever written to shame. And then the review is in quotes. Alien is a movie where nobody listens to the smart woman, and then they all die except for the smart woman and her cat. Four stars. Yeah, yeah. that is so, exactly what happens. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's exactly what happens. In space, no one can hear a woman. <laughs> yeah. That should have been the name to this. <laughs> uh, you were talking about Dan O'Bannon. Yeah, Dan O'Bannon had previously done a movie with John Carpenter called Dark Star. He also starred in that movie. That movie is intermittently funny, intermittently boring, intermittently cool. It's a lot of things. But one thing it did was absolutely, totally nail this portrayal of outer space and the people in it as just boring Joes going about their job. Every bit of machinery had scoring on it and had like stains and... They were just space truckers, basically, is what they started mm. with. And there's yeah. a lot of that to this. Not so a just... princess, not the king of the Imperium, not the chosen one. Mm -hmm. It's like Brett, the engine fixer in the Hawaiian shirt who smokes. <laughs> it's nice to hear a blue collar reaction to watch a character go, what the fuck is that? Mm -hmm. To something fantastic. Yeah. So this movie, as far as I see it, has two stars. It has Sigourney Weaver, who is fantastic, and it has The Alien by H.R. Giger. And that's another Dan O'Bannon thing. He was very influenced by the artwork of Giger, among other artists. Whoa, that's a big pet peeve of mine, is Chris Foss and Mobius getting knocked into among other artists. Ron Cobb, all of the interiors that aren't that spiral sort of rounded padding mm -hmm. all of the interiors are ron cobb all of the computers and machinery and hallways and floors and ceilings they're all based on sketches by ron cobb the greatest sci-fi well he was doing dark star also in 74 with with o'bannon so like they... ron cobb was yeah, yeah. so they okay. were the team listen i'm not taken away from giger sounds There's like you're the... taken away from giger no, I I just know that like every alien is just Giger, 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 Giger. And it just so happens that Ron Cobb is my favorite sketch artist who does storyboards and oh, wow. comes okay. up with ideas for interiors. And a longtime favorite of mine is sci-fi artist Chris Foss. He was the first guy who was painting spaceships and saying, I wonder what paint job it would have. And he did a lot of spaceships with stripes. Now I'm going to give it a cool paint job. Whereas mm -hmm. everybody else was gray, white, and black. Right. Chris Foss was painting colorful spaceships that looked like wasps with like black and yellow. Mm, um, yeah. Yeah. So like I was saying, there were two stars, Sigourney Weaver and the Alien. But at the time, Tom Skerritt was the big name they got. People forget today, but Tom Skerritt, who was in MASH, mm -hmm. who was in a number of movies in the 70s, he was kind of a big deal. I knew him on Cheers. You know, he came over as Rebecca's boss towards the, the tail end of the Cheers run. I remember that, yeah. But he had a long, successful career. And so he was a good get for this film. But over the years, it's really about Sigourney Weaver battling the alien. It's funny because his character, Dallas, almost by the nature of his character, he sort of steps aside as the lead, even before he dies. Um, yeah. Because I think that a big part of his motivation, and I'm, Ridley Scott has this thing where he gives people reams of information about their character that will never be told in the story, but he wants them to really know who they're playing. And I think a big part of Dallas's personality is that his heart's not in it. He'd rather sit in the like uh, escape pod or whatever and listen to classical music than command the ship. He doesn't like telling people what to do. He doesn't like working for the big company. And you can tell he's mopey. So he's automatically overshadowed by people who are sort of more motivated, even if it's not motivated to complete the mission. He's a wishy-washy character. Yeah, he, really he is. is. For a captain of a spaceship, mm -hmm. like, unheard of. Well, you almost get the idea with him that he's one of these guys who's like a year or two from retirement with half pay yeah. or something. He's like got one foot out the door sort of. So, he's getting too old for this shit. He's getting too old for this shit. So yeah. 
let's jump into the film. Okay. We open with one of the greatest openings of any sci-fi film, but maybe any film. We're out in the vastness of space, that long, luxurious title sequence with the font, Alien. Which I really but, like. Oh, I love it. And the computer slowly coming to life, the Nostromo slowly coming to life, the writing on the computer screen being Reflecting. reflected oh, on the helmet. I think that may be my favorite shot is the that stuff reflecting on the yeah, two helmets. Yeah, no, it's beautiful. And the commercial space tug Nostromo, great name, mm. uh, obvious connotations, is returning to Earth with its crew who are all sleeping. Chemically induced sleep or a machine induced sleep. Stasis pods, a e sci-fi standard. Right, for long space journeys so that you do not age while you sleep, correct? Cryogenic yeah, almost? Yeah, yeah. The ship's computer, nicknamed Mother, wakes up the crew. The crew suspects that they are at their destination, which is home, and they're going to get paid and go about their lives. But the captain, Dallas, played by Tom Skerritt, who is the only one who has access to Mother, finds out that they've been awoken early because as per their contract, <laughs> and it's hard mm -hmm. to believe that any like guys work in a Texas oil field today would have in, in their contract that if a spaceship lands, you got to go investigate, you know? Yeah, you got, you're, you're in charge of first contact. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they receive a transmission that is supposedly from intelligent origin, quote unquote, and they have to investigate. And that's when we find out that the crew isn't really cut out for this, even if it's a distress call and normal miners or something, or there's some military skirmish. This is a blue collar crew with a couple of science officers, a mm. captain, a couple of engineers, and a couple of grunt workers who do, you know, a lot of the lower level mechanic work played brilliantly by Harry Dean Stanton and Yafet Kato. In my head, they almost always dance on screen together. Mm -hmm. They're like a comedy team. Yeah. The styling. Yeah, like they of... come like bum bumbling in. I'm like, yeah. hey, oh, what'd we miss? Yeah. And you see yeah. one has a, Yafet has a headband and Harry has like a Hawaiian shirt and a baseball mm. cap and they're just not taking anything seriously. And then you have on the other end of the spectrum, Sigourney Weaver's character, Ripley, and Ash, the science officer, who both take everything seriously. And then Dallas kind of flies between them and kind of tries to be everything to everybody, but ends up being nothing. And then there's the wonderful Nancy Cartwright. Lambert, so good. Very yeah. good. And she was the young girl in The Birds by Alfred Hitchcock. She's had a long career, Witches of Eastwick, lots of things. She's great as usual. And John Hurt, well-respected British actor. He's brilliant in this. And I always suspect just from the interactions and the way that Nancy Cartwright plays her character that Lambert and Kane have some sort of relationship. Uh, really? Yeah. There's a shot that holds on Veronica Cartwright as she smokes and John Hurt is volunteering. His character is volunteering. We assume, you know, through that, I think that there's a relationship there that she's like, oh, you fucking, you always have to be the guy, oh, don't you? It's almost like under her breath, like, of course you do. Like, yeah, I, like I, something... I volunteer for that. Of course you do. Yeah. Like, fuck, don't like give a that, shit about leaving me alone when you die. Right. And I'm always watching Cartwright because she seemed personally offended by that and mm -hmm. kind of seems invested in him and not wanting him to do more things. That's how I saw it. All right. Uh, so look for that next time. you. Oh, yeah, right. I will <laughs> fight you on it. I'm sure I'll see it. So we learn bits and pieces about the crew, but we don't really have a foothold on how they're going to respond to it. They go into a smaller version of the Nostromo, a landing mm. craft, and they leave the Nostromo in this, this medium-sized craft and land on the surface a little ways from the origin of the signal. They hit something or they grind to a halt. The The planet is like almost dangerous shards of metal sticking up everywhere, right? Yeah, it's like, it's just not a good landing surface as far as I could tell. It's also very dark and windy and debris and- Yeah, they're landing on a moon or something. And mm. Dallas, Kane and Lambert head out to investigate the origin of the signal. They find the second amazing set piece after the Nostromo. Mm -hmm. They find the remnants 
of an alien craft, the work of H.R. Giger. And it is an alien inside a spaceship from years earlier. One thing about the alien is it has a large hole in its chest, or at least its torso. One of our explorers says it looks like it was made from the inside. Yeah. I forget which. That sounds like Kane. While this is happening off ship, on the ship, Ripley determines that the transmission message was actually a warning message. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. <laughs> Thus begins Ripley's journey as a science officer, as a person, as a woman trying to speak <clears throat> logic and speak facts to a mob ruled by obligation, patriotism, testosterone, <laughs> testosterone <laughs> and fear. Yeah. Oh, um, and greed. And greed. Yeah. Largely <clears throat> greed. Yeah. Th this ship is hauling millions of 200 pounds. 200 million pounds <laughs> of ore. Some yeah. kind of ore that we'll need in the future. <laughs> yeah. And so it's Kane, John Hurd's character, who discovers this chamber with mist that reacts to your touch and everything. And there are hundreds of large eggs. They almost reminded me of many versions of the Invasion of the Body Snatchers, these yeah, pods. Yeah, pods. Yeah, totally. And Kane notices that there's movement inside the pods. He is the most pure of heart of any character in here. Kane is the explorer. Kane is the scientist who puts his money where his mouth is. And he puts yeah. his helmet right up against the pod. And it opens and he sees this pulsating, undulating, almost like chicken breast. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Well, there's a lot of actual organic matter used in this yeah, film. Muscle and sinew and whatever. When he yeah. leans into that goo. Yeah. The, that like undulating is the right word. Mm -hmm. Undulating chicken breasts. Um, <laughs> what, what, when he leans into that, you have a tendency and I have a tendency to say like, oh, come on, who's going to stick their head in that scary thing? He doesn't know he's in Alien. Yeah. He, he he's a science guy and this is a thing like it's a, yeah. a thing he's checking out. I think it speaks to the naivete and innocence and childlike wonder inherent in all scientists, but it also equally speaks to the avarice of man and the mm. kind of testosterone and the kind of like we're the masters of the universe. You know, they take for granted that humans are at the top of every food chain. I think that every early explorer in the old world had this mentality where they're just like, they're the alpha. <clears throat> Kane quickly learns that they are not the alpha here. He learns it the hard way because this alien, as we find out, jumps up, snatches itself onto his helmet, eats through the helmet and attaches itself to his head and mm -hmm. wraps its tail, its tail or whatever around appendage. his throat. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, tightens its tendrils around his head. And is officially labeled the facehugger. Got a stage four facehugger. Each stage yeah. of the alien gets a name. That's what happens when you oh. have a good franchise. People start naming things. Yeah, it's you great. Know. So as that happens, he's there, he's screaming. And at this point, Dave, I was mentioning this moment earlier, they cut away and they just show you the outer spaceship on the planet. And we hear nothing but the faint echoes of wind and the absence of noise. I think that speaks to the tagline more than anything. It's that screaming. And then it's like, who are you screaming to with the next right. cut? Yeah. Your uh, crew so, is on another part of the planet, smoking cigarettes and drinking coffee. Yeah. So the crew gather him up and try to bring him onto the ship. Ripley, who realizes when Dallas and Kane are off the ship, she is in charge. She will not break the protocol, which calls for a quarantine because it puts everyone at risk if they bring him in. Her commanding officer, Dallas, is ordering her to open. She will not. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. <laughs> yes, pod bay doors moment. moment. Yeah, And she will not do it to her credit. She shows strength, she shows power, and she is immediately undercut by the science officer, Ash, who opens the door on his own volition. 
and literally walks up to the door and pushes the open button. Yeah. Doesn't like put in his two cents, just opens the door. Yeah. The first hint, maybe the first yeah. crack in the edifice of this crew where we're like, oh, wait a minute. Can we trust everyone? Why did he do that? Yeah. And he's this clean cut, crew cut guy. He's the one who keeps bringing up the rules. He He's the one who says, check your contracts. It's in there. He's been set up to be the perfect guy to say, no, we're not letting you in. I follow the rules. I'm cold and calculated and you'll die in the airlock unless you just come in without Kane. And he does the opposite you'd expect. He pops the door open and then says something so against his personality to Ripley says like, what would you leave him there to die? Yeah. Like, that doesn't sound like any science officer. Yeah, yeah. When Ripley confronts Ash, it's great because it's like even a robot gives a woman shit yeah. and refuses to acknowledge her power. Ash is a perfect replica of a man, right down to the misogyny. They even built it into the android, Dave. <laughs> yeah. There's a big reason why Ripley is such a feminist icon. To this day. Also, also, Ripley knows all men are full of shit. Micro vibrations in the air, my ass. Like, <laughs> right. Like, yeah. He's full of shit. All men are full yeah. of shit. I just want to say here, I want to point out the face hugger. If anyone were doing Alien today and it had never been a thing and they were trying hard to come up with something unique, they would kind of start with the face hugger. It would be part of the concept from Jump. And the mm -hmm. thing that I find interesting about Alien is that the whole face hugger and the impregnation of the alien into someone else was only dreamt up by these story writers, O'Bannon and Shusit, because they needed a clever way to get the alien onto the spaceship. They didn't want it to sneak on. They didn't want it like stuck to some break machine. Break in. Yeah. Break in. Like, you know, the thing where it just breaks down a wall. They wanted a really clever way to, for it to get onto the ship. That's when... Shusit, I believe, came up with, what if it just, you know, jumped on you and screwed you, you know, right. well, that's and the shot thing. its seed in you. After making that decision that you're talking about, they've completely changed this movie into something it cannot get away from. It is a sci-fi horror rape movie. This is how the alien gets on the ship. It rapes and impregnates one of the crew. You don't know how many people it's inside of at any mm. one time. Anybody could be the alien. You can have this inside you and be a normal functioning human being. You can have conversations. You can have lunch. You can smoke a cigarette. But you're not laying there sweating and convulsing. Right. Um, I just think it was very cool that they solved the story problem with what has become one of the most iconic bits of this whole alien mythos that they've created. Couldn't be more necessity is the mother of invention. It yeah. is 100% that and a beautiful example of it because that's the franchise. It is. Is that use of humans, yeah. Yeah, humans are nothing more than incubators for their children. Yeah. One really cool segment is when they're trying to investigate and get the alien off of his face and every single attempt almost kills him. They realize he's being choked to death by the tail, so they can't get that off. He's got some sort of long digit down his throat that is providing him with enough oxygen. They're worried if they take him off, they'll cut off the oxygen. Point out, Ash tries to stop them from taking it off completely. Mm -hmm. He's like, well, we don't know what it'll do. We could kill him. I don't. And Dallas is like, I'll take that chance, you know, right. get it off. But that's the second time that Ash. If you're looking for clues, watching it again is looking out for the alien. So they decide maybe we'll just sever some of the fingers. They make one little incision, a little slice on one of the digits of the fingers, and this corrosive acid shoots out of it and burns a hole through the table, the floor beneath it, the ceiling under that, through the floor beneath that. It's a great scene. They're chasing the acid down floor to floor. And they're like, it's going to eat through the hull. Yeah. At one point, Parker goes, don't get under it. Yeah, he does. <laughs> and the first shot of it eating the floor is so believable. I don't know how they did it. It was like, maybe it was like boiling water on wax or some kind of actual acid on, like, probably a, some actual, on like a floor made of sugar. Or something that, that eats through styrofoam. But it looks so real. Yeah. 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 Like if you've ever put gasoline in a styrofoam cup, 
Mm -hmm. The bottom of the cup is gone instantaneously. I think that's probably what happened. And then it's like a Mr. Wizard show. Like they take a pencil and they just hold (laughs) the acid and you can see it's smoking. I'll tell you what, what you got there is another necessity is the mother of invention because they actually were saying, what do we do about the fact that these guys could just shoot this thing? So they needed to solve that problem that these guys just couldn't use their, you know, pretty high tech guns. Right. Um, so once again, I believe someone even says like, that's quite a defense mechanism. You don't dare kill it. Yeah. And the acid inside the alien is used to great effect in subsequent films, in the sequels, in certain ones, they even use their own acid to like cut through chains and like, it's a cool device in general, like coming up yeah. with that. One of the coolest things about this movie monster is that every part of it is a weapon. You get the impression that even if you gave it a hug, you get cuts all over your fingers. Like Mm. it's got bones, it's got shards, it's got a big mouth with big teeth. Within that, there's another mouth. Like so, could have been a movie about face huggers. Yeah, it could have just been the face hugger, but it's not. So we don't know what to do with this thing. Later on, it seemed to fall off by itself, and they can't find it. And that's a great scene. Ripley and Dallas looking for it. And then they find it and it's dead. Kane comes around. He's there and he's hungry and he's eating. The crew is laughing with him. And it's got all the hallmarks of the kind of like, well, that was a crazy story. You can tell your grandkids. All good. All good. (laughs) Yeah. I'll add to that. It's in the comfort of that dining hall where that great opening dining room scene, wherever that nook is, where they eat. That's the happy place. That's where they chat. That's where they rib each other. And that's where they eat and drink, which is like one of the only happy things they do on a ship like that. So yeah. you're back in this very safe, fun, everything's okay group room. Right. And that's when they give it to you. Out of nowhere, he starts having convulsions. He starts yeah. freaking out. Everyone around him is freaking out. They don't know whether to put something in his mouth, like he's having a seizure or something. But they're all concerned, all except for Ash, who is not Who's reacting. Who's just watching calculatingly. Yeah. So notes. yet another weird thing with Ash. And that's the point at which one of the greatest moments in sci-fi cinema happens. The alien, a small version of the alien, bursts out of Kane's chest. And it is yeah. not the dark color of the alien as we know it. It is like any little marsupial or something. Yeah, it's fleshy, (laughs) except for for his shiny teeth. Oh, that's nice. (laughs) He's not as plush as what Dave just held up. I just held up my plush alien, Mm. but uh, it's actually Chrissy's plush alien. Oh, get you a woman. Uh, (laughs) So Exactly. (laughs) It's this little pink monster That's all teeth and tail and claws. (laughs) It's a little penis with teeth and tail and claws. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, somewhat. It is. It's a big (laughs) kind of. It's it's phallic. Which is very fitting because they're screwed. It goes without saying, Kane is dead. And this thing is uh, scurrying around. And they're trying to. Parker's got a steak knife. Right, right. (laughs) But Ash says, don't. Right. It escapes. It hauls ass across you know, which, the table, knocking over those amazing coffee cups, those composite oh, coffee cups. I love those. Oh, oh it's yeah. just so good. Yeah, it cruises through the, the table debris and out of the room. So only now do they follow any kind of science protocol. And they just, they eject Keen's body out into space, a burial at space, because I guess they're worried that it left traces behind or who knows, there could be five yeah, more but, in you there. Know, that they're officially thinking carefully. Yeah. Like up until now, it was like, oh, you feel better? All right, let's have mm-hmm. some dinner. Uh, yeah. Now they're like, we're going to jettison your body into space in case there's more <laughs> of those in you. Yeah. You know, it's funny, even, even mother, what are my chances? Dallas puts in and mother goes, does not compute, which is computer mm. lingo for your shit out of luck. Right. But like, it's funny that mother is the name given to the computer i just i really like that because again that's another birth thing that's another yeah there's a lot of birth motherhood and the franchise just leans into it later on we get newt 
and uh, Newt sort yeah. of becomes Ripley's daughter. And there's a queen alien, and the, the, there's so much there's birth, a mother. Yeah. yeah. The crew all band together. Dallas has them looking for the alien on the ship. They use tracking devices. They're looking for it, and it was this tiny little thing. So they're looking for a little thing, and they're looking for it almost the way you look for a feral cat. Like, they're being careful. Right. But last time they saw it, it was like eight inches they're tall or something. They're still feeling they have the advantage. Yeah. We're smarter, we're bigger, we have a cool net, we have uh, yeah. these sensors. They're still very vain about their brain power. They're, they can overcome whatever it is. And so they're looking for it. Brett, who is Harry Dean Stanton, he finds the alien the hard way. They're searching for the alien using one of these detectors. So they go looking and they go following the, the blip that they think is the alien. And they accidentally track jonesy the the ship's cat and it doesn't ready. get better than a bodega cat in space yeah that speaks I mean, to the lived in kind of space trucker thing it's great that there's a cat on this ship it really mm -hmm. is so the cat is hiding in a locker the cat knows what's up the beep leads them to this locker so they one gets ready with the net they're ready they all stand back they fling the door open it's a famous cat scare cat screeches jets out and I think Harry Dean Brett says, it's a cat. It's the cat. Like, relax. It's the cat. And even his partner, Yafikado, is like, yeah, now we got to catch it again. Yeah. Like, you got to go get the cat because yeah. you can't be following that blip around. And he's like, oh, yeah. okay, I'll go it's looking for the cat. But I love how they're so careful and they know that they're in danger. So there's three of them together. Mm. They find the cat. And then it's like, go get the cat. You screwed up so royally. You go off by yourself, Harry Dean Stanton. Like, where's yeah. the safety now? Go wander around in the dark, wet room yeah. with hanging chains. How is that a thing? <laughs> Poor Brett is looking around going, here, kitty, kitty, kitty. Mm. Here, kitty, kitty. Which is like a nice device. Like, yeah. you have to say, here, kitty, 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 while you're being stalked by this monster yeah. you don't yet know about. Brett is saying here kitty kitty and we see and this movie is great this way we see that the alien is behind him and he can't see it and it has grown exponentially just That's in the three short feet time. taller than him it's like nine <clears throat> feet tall yeah it is much bigger and jonesy is there witnessing the attack and watches him get killed brett is looking at the cat and the cat is reacting not to brett but reacting to the alien behind Brett. It's one of those like, oh, it's right behind me, isn't it? Yeah. And we should give credit. The alien, that big, tall alien behind him is actually Bolahi Badejo, who yeah. they met in a pub. And they're like, you are tall and gangly and you would make a great alien. Yeah. Isn't he like seven foot something? I think so. Yeah. I don't and think I, he well, worked again. I, don't, I never if, saw if the Peter alien. Mayhew didn't get the gig for Chewy, <laughs> I think. <laughs> Might have been. They were like, you are tall enough and skinny enough that you could be the thing we need to avoid the man in a suit problem, right. which is a huge problem. It's all about the alien. It's all about the monster. It was so risky that this movie would have fallen into monster movie. Well, we um, just came off the Muppet movie. There's a very similar artifice to the way that the monster alien is performed in this. You know, it's not always that gentleman wearing the alien. Sometimes mm. it just comes into frame. Sometimes we just see a head. Sometimes we just see limbs gangly yeah. coming at you. you know, I they, love the they, unfolding. They, There's often an unfoldingness oh, of it. Like it's yeah. coming out of a, a smaller version that it had right. rolled itself up in a ball. So it undoes yeah. itself. Yeah, so they do it a few different ways. And I think that helps with the otherworldliness of it. I also read that, I don't know what the running time of the movie is, but there's four minutes of footage of the alien you know when i was that's jaws time i was just bringing up jaws when <laughs> oh I was, were you yeah I'm sorry. yeah i was saying when i was talking about um all the different ways they show them i was thinking about how they had different sharks they have just a fin they have in jaws they have like the full you know bruce they right. had them on a gimbal they had just the barrels like there were many ways to present the shark without presenting the shark and it's the same way with the alien the barrels are a good point. Think about it. The barrels had a flashing light and a beep. I'm going to terrify my audience. How? 
with a flashing light. <laughs> Aliens does it with a blip on a screen. They're filming a little video game of a dot going boop, boop, boop. And it's scary. Yes. And at the time, which I think is somewhat lost today, those little blips were new. Yeah, you couldn't yeah. see them anywhere. Like in 1981, I think I was addicted to a little handheld game called Blast It. And it was mm -hmm. just like little red dots going everywhere. These were the things that were cutting edge for the time. You look back on it now and it's like, oh my God, was, was that beta? It's yeah. like so early on, but this was cutting edge stuff, you know? And yeah. just following it, you hadn't seen that in a million movies yet. Ridley Scott realized like, I can make that little green dot scary. Yeah. So they think that the alien is in the air ducts because it's getting around very easily. So Dallas enters with a flamethrower, like he's Rick Dalton. And <laughs> so like they were closing off air ducts and it was just going to be one place the alien could go and Dallas would kill it. One of the big scares in the movie, he's following it and they're following it. And they're like, he's right there. Move, move, move. But no matter where he runs, he's seemingly just on it. And that's when he realizes and he looks up the alien. There's this great shot. It's like... It's like I the know, hands yeah. come right at you. Yeah, the viewer. like Al Jolson. It's like, yeah. ah. <laughs> Jazz hands at you. Yeah. Terrifying. Out of nowhere. Yeah. We don't watch Dallas die. That's what we get. We get those hands. Yeah. And that's it. Next scene is uh, Parker throws Dallas's flamethrower on the table and goes, that's all we found. Right. So now Lambert is like, to, yeah. let's get the hell out of here. You know what? Both women have been nothing but reasonable from jump. No, don't do that. They're like, mm. let's get out of here. So Lambert finally gets what she wants. She She's like, let's get an escape shuttle and leave. But Ripley lets her know it won't support four people. She wants to go after the alien. That's she wants the only to try way. again. Try Dallas's plan again. There's really two halves to the movie. There's Ripley just as, you know, an officer trying to do her job. And then there's Ripley from this moment on realizing that she's up against more than just an alien. Mm -hmm. She accesses mother because with Dallas gone, Ripley is in charge. She has the rights and they find out Ash has his own set of orders that he's supposed to bring this alien back. And that's his only order. You don't need to bring the crew back. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're expendable. I don't know, Dave, is this easy for you to swallow? Or is it a little bit of a big pill to swallow? Like it is for me that like, we're going to send this crew out. They're going to work for what? A couple of years getting that Collecting much millions ore. of ore. And then, and only then on the way back, we're going to put them in stasis. And then we're going to activate this almost sleeper cell of a science officer, Ash, mm -hmm. in order to get one alien to bring it back here to develop into some sort of weapon or something. How did they even know about it? I mean, if you got to go out that far to get it, were there other miners that were killed? Look, I can totally, I'll do it quickly. Yeah. The earth is a corporate planet at this point. 2024, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the registration number on the Nostromo is nine digits. That's a million of something. Mm. I don't know if the first ship was number one, the first mining ship, mm -hmm. but when you have a nine digit registration number, that's a lot of ships. Anyway, they are part of this massive thing. And there's all kinds of ways these companies are trying to make money. And this signal was picked up by another one of their ships. But there's also a larger, like, overreaching corporation that keeps an eye on everyone. And they have to carefully skirt the rules. They have to come upon this. So they're like, let me know if we have any ships that are scheduled to be in the area, and we'll have it accidentally fly through the signal and we'll wake them up. I can totally see it. I can totally see it. When you think about how massive this whole, I mean, the movie is largely about corporate greed over human life. Yeah. I think that's one of the main reasons that theme, why it is aged like fine wine, because that's where we fucking are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It hit the nail on the head. Just COVID time. People started saying like, Hey, I think maybe the company I work for doesn't give a shit about me. Be like, ah, yeah. <laughs> um, 
It used yeah. to be if someone got fired after they worked somewhere for 15, 20 years, it was like the, it was like you could make a movie about it. He was fired after 20 years of dedicated service. That's accepted now. Everyone knows no matter how long you work for anyone, they don't give a shit. He's worked 20 years for Nostromo and all he got was a gold watch and a face hugger. So I just explain it through the corporate ladder or whatever. But you're right. It's it's a lot to ask. It's a lot to ask. Yeah, it's a bit. But this is a world a lot more complicated and convoluted than ours. Ripley finds out Ash's mission. Ash is like right over her shoulder, knows that she knows, and he tries to kill her. There's a theme running through this film. And at one point- Sexual like, violence wise. Sexual violence wise. He rolls up a newspaper. It's a porno mag. Oh, a porno mag. And he yep. tries to shove it down her throat. She is saved by Parker, who like clubs him with a Louisville slugger or a, a pipe or something. Something like one, yeah. And knocks his head off, but it's still mostly. attached. Right. Mostly. And that's when we find out that all this time, Ash has been an android or a mm -hmm. robot of sorts. And I love, love, love the decision to give him milky white blood or mm -hmm. amniotic fluid or something that is helping it's, the electricity to work just like in our bodies. Yeah, or something. chemical slash electrical, not unlike the alien that he's biomechanical, but the alien seems more metally and Ash seems more bio-y. It's like a collection of like pearl onions and it's milk. Great. It's great. Yeah, I love it. So good. And yeah. Ripley wants answers out of him. So she reactivates his head. He's clearly under the table and just his head is like, you know, in a cutout or something. But it's handled so well with the fake head and the way they tilt him. And, and the and audio effects are pretty great. The too, audio there's effects a gurgling are great. slash mm -hmm. uh, distortion that is yeah. just and Solid. there's an awkward cut between when they tilt him and then you see him start to it's talk a, there's video of ridley scott being asked that question and being like i know i know oh really oh that's uh, great we're out of yeah. money yeah hey man yeah. it works they'd forgive him anything by this point and ash's voice then it's like someone talking with milk in their mouth digital gurgling it's manipulation like. oh so good yeah it's really good Ash speaks and fills in some of the blanks for her. You know, you can't kill this thing. And good luck, guys. And so Parker, on his way out of the room, turns around and says, I'm going to toast that marshmallow. Ripley and the rest of the crew is like, let's get the hell out of here. We're going to set the whole thing for self-destruct. And we're going to escape in the shuttle. We've seen this in countless films. Two of them, Parker and Lambert, they go getting supplies. Go off on a side quest. That's like the serial killer secondary location. That's like But they need the oxygen if there's going to be three people on a two on a one person shuttle. Right. They need these oxygen tanks. Otherwise, they're just getting into a death hey, trap. Go everywhere together. Oh, Dave, yeah. if yeah, if you and I were in a film, we'd be in each other's hip pocket the whole time if there was aliens about. Like you don't separate. The second you separate, it's all over. We've seen enough movies. We know this. Yeah. They end up dead. It's just Ripley and Jonesy the cat. Ripley initiates the self-destruct, but she can't get to the shuttle because the alien's in the way. And then there's that great harried kind of like, she's got to undo the self-destruct. And you're sure she's going to get it in the last second. Yeah. We've seen that like, a million times. Okay. She's going to stop it at three or two. I hope not one. That would seem ridiculous. Yeah. And then yeah. she doesn't make it. She doesn't make it. Which, yeah. how much respect for the audience does that show? I think it may be the very first time mm -hmm. I've seen someone try to diffuse something with a timer right. and fail. Yeah, she's our hero. Our hero always gets it done. Mm -hmm. The heroine always wins in the end. But no, not this time. She couldn't do it. So she's going to be blown up there because she can't get away. But she heads back. And this time she doesn't see the alien. And so she's like, all right, great. Yeah. She grabs Jonesy. She gets in the escape shuttle. She takes off. And that's another great sequence. She takes off and she just reaches minimum safe distance mm -hmm. before the Nostromo explodes and creates this wonderful kind Yeah, of... one of the first horizontal like, yeah. explosions I've seen. There was a lot of those after that. Beautifully done. More 2001 than Star mm. Wars. 
it's the 2001 feel stuff in this movie the waking up from the pod with the lifting covers and kane sort of just sitting there breathing it's those 2001 scenes i think that elevate this movie above monster movie which was super important it's easy to get grouped in with godzilla and king kong and and a, and a dozen other things and it does a great yeah. job of being a real science fiction movie and that explosion is one of the things, yeah. Especially since, if you remember back, you know, Star Wars comes out. A couple of years later, you get Alien. But in between, there were a million Star Wars imitators who mm -hmm. did not do it well. So right. it was really hard at that point to get something this well-crafted out into the world Everybody wanted to put their fingerprints on it or be like, hey, cut corners here. Or like, can't we have somebody with like a snake head or something? Like, right. so to try and get the purity of this vision across, this was a really big accomplishment. Yeah. It, the Nostromo explodes. It explodes. She's in her escape shuttle. She prepares to go back into stasis. That's when she discovers with like a little jump scare, she sees something move in the corner of her eye. And she sees that the alien, as we had said earlier, is all like crawled up into a box. It's just shoved into a bunch of mechanical wires and pipes. And it's, it's biomechanical makeup makes it almost a camouflage for spaceships. Yep. Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah, it's really nice. She is actually backing away into a closet while this mm -hmm. thing is taking itself out of the spot where it's hit itself. Ripley manages to take her eyes off it for a moment and looks to her right and says, oh, I'm in here with the spacesuits. And you see her have this spark of an idea and she starts carefully climbing into the spacesuit. Very slowly crawling into mm -hmm. the spacesuit. And it, it's great too, because before that moment, like what's scarier than encountering an alien? Encountering it's an encountering alien, an alien naked. naked, mostly naked. Right. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, it's encountering an alien with the world's narrowest pair of underwear. Yeah. We routinely have dreams where, you know, something's after us or people are looking at us or whatever. And the thing that takes it up a notch is you're naked or you're practically mm -hmm. naked, like no weapons. So and she's it's not as if room. our clothing is armor. It, no, it but it's got offer, a psychological. It real, right. There's no real protection, but there's psychological protection that is huge. Yeah. Yeah. She gets in the suit. She clamps the helmet. Right. And then she makes her way to the chair. She straps herself into the chair. And I think she even sings to herself. Lucky Star. It's like a, I don't know what it's from. It's from a musical, maybe Singing in the Rain or something. It makes sense that they went to something classic that might have survived through iterations eons from now, as opposed to some popular singing, song it's not lucky star by lucky madonna. star by madonna <laughs> right but she's um, she's like you are my lucky mm. star and she's trying to keep herself calm she's strapping herself in to various seat belts into the chair she's trying not to look but sort of looking out of the corner mm -hmm. of her eye at the alien as it unfolds itself she turns <laughs> away for a second she turns back and is like fuck it i'm gonna look and it's right next to her with its smiling teeth. Yeah, dripping. And that's when she slams on the airlock open button. The airlock opens. The alien is sucked out. And this, Dave, is the one point where the casting of that tall gentleman, what's his name? Bolahi Badejo. That's where their casting of him fails because they had to use a stuntman. And so that scene is nothing more than a guy in a rubber suit. That's where you get the guy in the rubber suit. It looks like a guy who's like five foot nothing. She also brought a grappling gun from the uh, locker. Mm -hmm. So she knocks him out the rest of the way with the grappling gun. And then the door slams shut. And the thing is now trapped outside and bouncing around on this umbilical, which is the grappling gun cord. And it looks like a five foot nine stunt man. Yeah, it looked more like Billy Barty to me. It's one of the least believable shots in the movie. They could have even like squished the film or something. I just or did a looks, smaller hatch make yeah, the ship he smaller. Looked, yeah, um, he looked stubby. It, it, it's a bummer. And it's it's like, a bummer. You, should, also, you want to leave on a high note, you know? You do. Also, I'm anti George Lucas tinkering with all the Star Wars films. But here's something where like if Ridley Scott had come out with his director's cut. And he was like, I found an NBA player who could wear the suit. 
right and i shot just you know second unit stuff and i kind of and with the stuff they can do patching in things today with software digitally yeah i mean it could have been a writhing elongated alien right yeah so i wouldn't have kicked up a fuss but I'm all for not messing with classic movies. The alien then, its only instinct is to survive. It crawls back into in. the jet. Like, like maybe I'll just hang on here for the whole ride Fortuitously, home. I mean, I, he, he not necessarily wrongly sees the jet as like a hole leading into the spaceship. Like, yeah. maybe I can get back in through here. And that's when <laughs> and Ripley hits flips. the jet yeah. and the fire comes out and just consumes the alien. We see the little bits of acid dripping from them. Nice touch. And then it's just shot off yeah, into I space. I think it cooks the cord that's holding him. So that cord right. lets go and he's gone. Yeah. And now Ripley can actually peacefully get ready right. for the long journey. Right. Home. She completes her little log and she puts herself and Jonesy into stasis for the trip back to Earth. I don't think they were thinking sequels when this ended. I think it was tied up pretty nicely. And in your head, you were thinking when she gets home, she's going to expose what this company did and warn people yeah. of what's if out you, there. If you, if you could erase having seen the rest of the franchise, you're definitely thinking she gets back. She tells the story. She's doing talk shows. She exposes this. And, and, yeah. and also, they, you know, but having seen that stuff, and I don't even remember specifically, but you know, her return is going to be about <clears throat> Ripley. Where's the 200 million pounds <laughs> of ore? Like you guys yeah. had 200 million, you blew up 200 million pounds mm -hmm. of ore? Well, the funny thing is Aliens, the sequel done by James Cameron is a great movie. It's a great I, yeah, movie. It's actually my favorite. If given the choice, I watch that one. But it's funny to me that they were like, okay, we, we got to come up with a sequel. Why don't we surround Ripley with more men this time mm -hmm. who don't believe her? who were like, stand behind me, little lady, who right. were like, I'll show you how to fire a gun, who were like, well, uh, your log doesn't jibe with what we knew here at the company and you have to operate a forklift. And like, it's almost like they wanted to double down on the feminism in the second one in a way. And I'm with that. The entire movie, I didn't realize it until I was watching Alien this time. Aliens, I would almost call it a shot for shot remake. Paul Reiser is Ash. Yeah. <laughs> um it's just every like and it does the exact same things it's like she escapes and thinks that there's no more alien but it turns out the alien has hung on to the ship right. i kept saying like oh that's what they do in aliens oh that's what they do in aliens oh that's what they do in aliens and i realized yeah. like aliens is a remake it's a double down all over the place and yeah you're so right like they could have been like Ripley proved her point and now she's the leader and the captain of the ship and everybody <laughs> listens to her and, and there's several other women in positions of power mm -hmm. nope yeah I mean I was half expecting when aliens opened that it would be like we're joined today by Ripley the hero of the Nostromo massacre like you don't know what they could have created for her, what life, what celebrity they could have created for her in the future one. But mm -hmm. it is bleak. Like all she was met with was interrogation and disbelief and condescension. It's rough. That's a rough yeah. way to go. There's something I wanted to mention in uh, Ash's rolled up magazine scene, because I was watching that scene and I was like, I was thinking about Ash saying after Kane's chest burst, he refers to the alien as Kane's son. Yeah, they that. talk, wow. they met, they're like, and now that thing is loose on the ship. And he's like, Kane's son. And I'm like, this guy is infatuated with yeah. human beings and how they procreate and how they have sex. And, and now I'm guessing he's a Ken doll. He's got nothing. And he's got a lot of pent up hostility. And he's got all kinds of feelings about it. New um, Android style feelings. And That's which a good is point. why he creepily rolls up a magazine and tries to shove it down her throat. Yeah, you know, I had forgotten how much of this stuff, like how much of this movie was sexual and sexualized. And another reason why Giger was perfect for it, because all of his stuff had strong sexual tones. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I was yeah. thinking of something while I rewatched it for the 10th time or 12th time or 20th time. And that was this. Everybody who writes streaming movies and writes TV shows today is getting a new note from TV executives, from all the people who 
make decisions from the gatekeepers. They're getting this note on some of their scripts. This isn't second screen enough. And right. what that means is, for anyone who doesn't know, is that they want people to be able to follow along with the action while they're on their phone or their laptop scrolling and paying half attention to the screen. That's why if you've ever wondered why you're watching something and you're like, all right, we know this already, move on. Why are they repeating this? Move on. Or mm. there's another scene that's reminiscent of the previous scene. It's because they're hammering home the same facts over and over for people who are half watching. That's where we are, Dave. And yeah. I wonder if a movie like Alien could unfold the way it does today and not get that note. You know, this is not second screen enough. I think when that term first started getting bounced around, I think people thought it meant you have to win over the second screen. That'd be a no, better that, way. It would be nice if you were trying to get people to put their phone down, but that's not. It is, you need to be able to watch this whole movie while scrolling Instagram. That's what they're saying. It's crazy. As you can tell behind me, I have thousands of records. What a record requires of you is that you shut everything else out and you listen to it. You can have it on in the background while you're doing other things, but you can't have it on in the background while you're listening to other things intently. To get everything out of it, you need to listen to it. It needs to be a ritual. And watching uh, movies should be a ritual. I put it to you that Alien is second screen proof it is one that you're going to put the phone down for. You get more out of it the more you pay attention, you know, and much like films like Barry Lyndon by Kubrick or 2001 by Kubrick, the long shots and the slow pace is meant to draw you in and mm -hmm. it's meant it's to slow your mind down and to put you in the head of the characters. It's there for a reason. And so yeah. if you're second screening something like Alien, you are not getting everything out of the movie. You're not being rewarded the way that the director nice. wants you to be. Let Ridley Scott put your head where he wants it so that you'll be affected properly by what's coming. It's going to take time. It's going to take visual. It's going to take audio. And I'm going to get your head to where I want it so that I can do this other thing. One of the things I loved about Metallica when I first started listening to them is they were a metal band that realized that... Chugga, 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 sounds twice as hard if you spend a few minutes going yeah like if you play beautiful little notes then the hard scary notes sound harder and scarier mm -hmm. so everyone listening right now please let ridley scott face hug you right with let this him movie. put your head where he wants to <laughs> Uh, good work, Dave. Thank you. Mother. Fantastic, Hollis. Hollis and Dave would like there. to thank you for enjoying Pop Culture Graveyard.